worst of the COVID wave that has really hit China hard, especially in recent weeks, could be over. So I would watch and see how uh, the DAX and how markets in uh, Paris and London react. Yeah, thank you so much. We'll head to that Asian market uh, later on in the program. Thank you, Stephen. And uh, talking about uh, UK inflation, and we have that conversation coming up with Juliana now. Uh, it's a 40-year high at 9%, really at the borderline of a double digit. And consumers uh, are feeling it's like, I mean, like Juliana will always say, it already feels like a double digit already. Hi, Juliana. Good afternoon. So how does this 9% feel like at this time? Uh, good afternoon, Innie. Well, as you said, it feels much more. And um, according to charity workers and the opposition Labour Party, it is affecting people in the UK differently. So if you are a higher earner, yes, you will also be feeling the pinch, but not enough and not as much as those on less uh, privileged incomes, which is why, uh, as you can imagine, uh, Prime Minister's questions, which had just wrapped up uh, a few minutes ago, was dominated by the cost of living crisis um, and uh, the opposition benches demanding uh, that uh, Boris Johnson uh, does more. As you said, this morning the ONS did reveal uh, the data that I think we were all expecting, uh, that consumer price index has uh, risen by 2% month on month, because it was 7% in March, 9% in April, and that's 9% over a year. And any the cost of living blows just keep on coming, because as soon as the ONS released that data, we also heard from motoring association groups such as the AA and the RAC confirming that yet again diesel and petrol is rising at an alarming uh, rate. Um, in some cases, depending on where you're getting your petrol, up to 30% more uh, than it was just a few months ago. Um, this uh, uh, spike in the consumer price index has, uh, of course, uh, got lots to do with uh, an unprecedented rise in uh, gas and electricity um, uh, bills and the cost of energy earlier this year. And then, of course, Ofgem, um, the energy regulator, lifted bills by as much as 54 percent. And we are going to be getting it again in October. They will meet again. And we've already been warned uh, that it will come. Um, so the Bank of England Governor, Andrew Bailey, he was hauled into uh, Parliament um, earlier this week uh, because MPs were not happy uh, that the Monetary Policy Committee uh, set a really gloomy outlook uh, for the year. Uh, but it's happening. We are seeing it happening in real time. And it's very worrying. I think if you go with 40 years is a long time um, in it to go back and see uh, that prices weren't as high as they were now. And mm -hmm. there is a lot of criticism now being aimed at the Bank of England uh, because interest rates are at 1%. And uh, some were saying that if the Bank of England reacted uh, much quicker, um, as fast perhaps as what we saw with Jerome Powell across the pond, then we wouldn't be in a situation as bad as we are. Yeah, I guess that's why the U.S. Fed have said they are going to keep increasing rates until inflation is captured or dealt with. Uh, I wonder when that will be. Well, I mean, the CBI is also talking about this, and they're saying it's critical that the government helps people facing real hardship in this uh, squeeze. So uh, the, the thought is, how can the government help without stoking inflation even more? Well, so it's, a, it's a billion pound question, and one that I'll leave to the man who, who should be answering that question, um, Innie, which is the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Shunak, um, who looked a little bit downcast as he sat uh, next to um, his boss, uh, the Prime Minister. Um, you, you mentioned the CBI, which is the Confederation of uh, British Industry, uh, by far the leading business lobby group. They speak on, uh, on behalf of, I would say, over 100,000 businesses in the UK, um, but it's not just them. We've heard from the boss of John Lewis, we've heard from the boss of Next, we've heard uh, from the chairman um, of Tesco asking the government to do the moral thing, dip their hand in their pocket and help those who are struggling the most. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about a windfall tax. That seems to have gone um, off the shelf uh, because there was an emergency vote in Parliament earlier this week and Tory MPs who have an overwhelming majority voted it down. That came up um, in PMQs earlier today. But also Rachel Reeves, who's the shadow, ch shadow chancellor, she spoke about the Labour Party putting in motion an emergency debate um, which should 
hopefully and potentially uh, trigger uh, some sort of vote on whether or not there should be this emergency budget. Now, the Chancellor is liking uh, to bat uh, these issues away, uh, but they're not going away because we've heard uh, from so many charity groups, so many organisations saying that, you know, uh, families are skipping meals. Uh, some parents are not eating just so their children can eat. It is, it's a really incredible situation, particularly because if you think about it, you know, Britain is a G7 economy. It is one of the most industrialised nations in the world. This money isn't coming from nowhere. It is coming from the taxpayer. Anybody who pays tax in the UK has put money aside for these times. So it is becoming uh, almost ludicrous, I would say, to quote one journalist earlier this morning, that the Chancellor is not doing enough. Again, some would say, is this because the Chancellor, who's married to one of the world's richest women, who comes from a very wealthy um, Indian family, just doesn't have any idea of what normal people in this country are living with. But uh, time will only tell. And I am anticipating and expecting a U-turn anytime soon. And as soon as that's announced, of course, we'll be discussing it together, Any? <laughs> yeah, and honestly, Julian, I'm also looking for a U-turn on that windfall tax. I mean, because what's the reason for turning it down? If the oil companies are making more money, why can't they pay more taxes, you know, to cushion uh, all of this effect? I mean, but anyway, let's, let's see how the market is reacting to all of this. Well, uh, no surprises uh, that uh, the square mile was in the red in a panic because, of course, uh, the UK economy uh, could potentially be heading into a technical recession much sooner uh, than we anticipate. The FTSE All Share at intraday is down by 0.06%. The FTSE 100 is down by 0.26%. And the FTSE 250 slightly up by 0.59%. In the currencies market, the British pound is down on the US dollar by 0.63%. Down two on the euro by 0.26% and down on the Japanese yen by 0.85%. Worth mentioning, Innie, that the sell-off on the British pound is actually its worst performing day since before the pandemic. So it just goes to show uh, that uh, this cost of living crisis is biting anywhere, everywhere. And unfortunately, it doesn't appear uh, to be abating anytime soon. Yeah, unfortunately. So thank you so much, Juliana. Enjoy the rest of your day. Try, at least. <laughs> thank you. Well, let's move to that Asian market we talked about uh, with Stephen earlier. Shares in that Asian market were mixed today following overnight comments from the U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell, who said that he's resolved to raise rates until inflation comes down. The Nikkei 225 in Japan rose almost 1% under day to 26,911 0 while the topics index climbed almost 1% also to 1,884.69. Japan's economy shrank by 1% on an annualized basis in January to March as compared with the previous quarter. Elsewhere, mainland Chinese stocks closed lower with the Shanghai Composite down 0.25% to 3,085.98. Other Shenzhen component dipped 0.19% to around 11,208. The Hang Seng Index in Hong, Kong, in Hong Kong sat fractionally lower as of its final hour of trading. Now in South Korea, Kospi finished the trading day 0.21% higher. Australian stocks also saw gains as the S&P AX200 climbed 0.99%, closing at over 7,000. MCSI's Rodex Index of Asia Pacific shares outside Japan rose 0.6%. In the United States, U.S. stock futures fell after another major retailer warned of rising cost pressures, confirming the fears over inflation that have sent major benchmarks to big losses so far this year. Features for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, average shed 99 points, with the average set for the first loss in four days. S&P 500 features trade is 0.8% lower, while Nasdaq 100 features slipped 1.1%. Well, we have... Our correspondent in Washington now, Maria Bird, to give us details of how trading was on Tuesday. Uh, well, it looks like... Uh, better on Tuesday, as it made some major recoveries from Monday. The Dow Jones was up by 1.33%. The S&P 500 up by 2.01%, and the NASDAQ up by 2.75%. 
many investors were eager to snatch up some of the low prices on the airline and tech industries. It is clear that many investors are hopeful that the Federal Reserve will not have a major impact on the movement forward of the U.S. markets. The chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank is stating that it may have to increase unemployment rates as a way to decrease inflation. They are also anticipating that they will have to increase interest rates again in June and July. This could fare not well for the U.S. market, but we will continue to watch to see what Certainly, we'll continue to watch uh, that space and every market space uh, globally. Well, we'll have more stories for you, mostly from the African continent, but that'll be after the break. This is Business Incorporated on Channel Television. You're welcome back. You're still watching Business Incorporated on Channel Television. Let's head to Ghana now, where surging prices are posing a challenge to policymakers who prefer to have a key lending rate above headline inflation. The Bank of Ghana already increased the benchmark rate to a three-year high of 17% at its last meeting, pushing the gauge above the headline inflation. At the time, the most recent data put inflation at 23.6%. And that leaves policymakers, policymakers in a tight spot as they prepare to announce their latest stance on the 23rd of May, and just like Nigeria, next week too, we're looking forward to that MPC. So as the Monetary Policy Committee plan for meeting next week, we have uh, Professor John Gatsi, he's the Dean at the University of Cape Coast School of Business, to share with us his expectations and other burning issues in Ghana. Good afternoon, Professor Gatsi. Thank you so much for joining us. So um, inflation at 23.6%, uh, give us the real feeling, the reality of it. What does it translate to there for you living in Ghana? Well, it has translated into many uh, issues. Prices have gone up significantly, uh, including important uh, items and uh, items produced locally. Uh, we are feeling it so much in the area of food prices. Uh, it has also translated into uh, monetary policy uh, engagement. And we are also expecting that this uh, will fuel upward development in uh, the current monetary policy announcement that will be coming very soon. So prices across board have, got, have gone up. Cost of living has gone up. And uh, it's like uh, it creates a lot of uncertainty as many events have taken place that will have passed through effects to fuel inflation further and anchor up uh, interest rates. So uh, the MPC is meeting again on Monday. What are your expectations? Uh, do you see them raising rates again? It will be surprising if the rate is not raised because the level of movement upward in inflation is alarming. Uh, other factors like the fiscal measures uh, are also debilitating. Uh, then we also are expecting some announcement very soon in terms of uh, water tariff and electricity tariff going up. All these things will have passed through effect, and therefore, uh, the only option for the monetary policy authority is to raise up uh, the rates. But as to the level of increase that will be announced, uh, I cannot speak for that absolutely, but we are confident that the situation calls for an uh, upward review of the policy rates. Wow. Wow. Not very good times at all around the world, in the UK, in Nigeria, in Ghana, because I know that's there in Ghana. You still have the e-levy and now you're expecting electricity tariff also to be raised. Not very good times. But we really have to thank you so much, uh, Professor John Gatsi, Dean at the University of Cape Coast School of Business. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. 
So moving on now, the Ethiopian Ministry of Finance, uh, the Ethiopian Investment Holdings and the FZD Africa have signed a cooperation agreement to establish Ethiopian Securities Exchange and it's going to be called the ESX. We might soon be reporting that as uh, one of our major markets that we are following at the beginning of the program. Or well, the creation of ESX seems to be finally happening after initial finalization announcement in 2020. Some time ago, when the military government in Ethiopia was abolished, the Addis Ababa share dealing group went along with it and no capital markets existed in Ethiopia. In the late 1950s, there were attempts to re-establish a capital market, but the efforts didn't last. When the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed came to power in 2018, the country was opening up more, seeking to pursue economic reforms and establish a stock exchange governing body. And so it is finally happening two years after it was signed. In Zimbabwe, the country has abandoned bank lending ban that stalled economy. A government had said that measure was needed to stop currency fall. Zimbabwe lifted a 10-day ban on bank lending as critics warned that the government has shattered confidence in the already stagnant economy while the ban was announced by our President Emerson in a bid to hold the runaway depreciation of the Zimbabwe dollar it quickly chilled economic activity with agri-processing companies, including sugar mills, saying they couldn't advance funds to farmers to grow their crops. Well, that led to gradual relaxation, with the government first saying it didn't apply to commodities and then allowing citizens to access to foreign currency to import their own goods. And uh, just before we go, let's see what's happening in the oil space. Uh, oil prices rose today on expectations uh, that easing COVID-19 restrictions in China will boost demand and supply concerns. And Brent crude was up 0.65% at $112.66 per bar barrel, while U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude climbed at 1% to $113.52. And that's reversing some of the previous season's losses. Hopes of further lockdown easing in China boosted expectations for demand recovery. The country's authorities allowed 864 Shanghai's financial institutions to resume work a day after the Chinese city achieved a milestone of three consecutive days with no new COVID-19 cases outside the quarantine zones. European Union's failure to persuade Hungary to lift its veto on proposed embargo on Russian oil is adding price pressure, although some diplomats expect agreement on a phase ban at a summit at the end of this month. Meanwhile, the European Commission is set to unveil a 210 billion euro plan for how Europe can end its reliance on Russian fossil fuels by 2027. In the metal space, now futures were flat today as the dollar recovered slightly, piling pressure on greenback, a price bullion, along with firm treasury yields and an aggressive inflation stance by the U.S. Federal Reserve chief. Futures were down just 0.04% at 1,818.10 per ounce. Spot gold, however, climbed 0.3% to 1,819.78. Gold has been consolidating since the end of last week, but the overall direction is down and it's going towards $1,750. The dollar hedged higher after a three-session slide, increasing the appeal of gold for this time. And, uh, and uh, gold also has been consolidating since last week. And that's where we leave it up for today. We have uh, another one tomorrow. Join us then. I'm Amy John Mekwa.